Good afternoon, all. Can you hear me okay yes. in the back? A lot of times, I, you know, we get the, when we get up here, we talk for an hour, and, and it, the mic's been off all the time. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but uh, nobody tells you. And uh, so I, th I usually check out to see where I'm at before I start. But uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Dan Cruz. He was the one that uh, contacted me, made the arrangements, and he picked me up at the airport and did everything that uh, was supposed to be done. And he got to wait over a couple hours because the plane that we were on got almost here and something went wrong and they, we turned around and went back. I think it would have been easier just to keep coming. <laughs> You know, but we went back and got on another plane and came, so we, we were a little late yesterday. And uh, I don't know, I have to check. I think I'm relegated to uh, about one hour, so I'm going to have to keep a track of this, keep a track of the time here. And I didn't know exactly what uh, you people wanted to hear. I can give you an overall of what uh, we did and where we were, but uh, I would... If that's okay with you, I will just kind of skip through it to, to get it all, try to get it all in, in an hour. But actually, I have talked to uh, people in Washington, D.C., where they required like a three-hour talk. And I thought, well, I'll come here and beat that. I'll give a four-hour talk. <laughs> no, just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, they did require quite a lengthy talk back then those days there in Washington, D.C., but uh, I think we'll start out. Uh, the paratroopers were uh, started many years ago. Uh, it was in, in World War I, but uh, they, they got the chutes and they got the bombers to drop the men and everything. And just about the time they were ready, it was Americans that did it, by the way. And uh, just about the time they were ready to drop the uh, paratroopers to break the stalemate, uh, the armistice was called, and so they never got to use them. They did make one mass jump in 1928 in Waco, Texas, and it's come up to present day that in 1942 they needed a, a new outfit, a new uh, shock troop, so to speak, and so they, be, they started the uh, paratroopers of today. They started that in 1942, and uh, there was Yarborough was one of the first uh, volunteers and he himself designed the jumpsuit, the 1942 jumpsuit. And if you notice the pockets on the tops, they're angled. So the hand fits, it goes in on the angles. Everything, everything fits on this, we have the large pockets because when the paratrooper drops behind the lines, he has to carry everything that he's gonna be using for, well, and we were dropped in Holland, we were there 72 days. And if you women think that a, uh, walk-in closet is pretty small. Try a musette bag for 72 days. <laughs> Try wearing the same socks for 72 days, not to mention the underwear. Like the old saying, they said, we're going to have a change of underwear. Joe, you change with Jim. Jim, you change. <laughs> so, <laughs> that got to you, huh? <laughs> well, what the heck? Better than running around naked in a battlefield. But uh, we, uh, we did uh, build up the paratroopers, and I was, uh, figuratively, I was among the first uh, paratroopers, and we uh, dropped from C-47s. Nearly all of us trained in Fort Benning, Georgia. Later on, there was a training uh, uh, unit and set up in England with uh, drop towers, 250-foot towers, and all just like we had in Georgia because we were running very, very short of paratroopers real quick. They used us pretty hard. And anyway, we, uh, we landed in England, and our unit was assigned to the uh, Hightown Stables in Alborn, England. And we lived in them for 11 months, so you can imagine my surprise when I re read Steve Ambrose said, Easy Company found the stables, cleaned them up, and they lived in them. Uh, it's kind of tough to get two outfits in one stable. But we, uh, we did live in the stables for 11 months, and from there, we, uh, we went through extensive training, and we made, uh, got ready for Normandy. And in Normandy, we, uh, we had extensive training and, and schooling ahead of time. We had sand tables set up, and every hour, almost on the hour, they brought in aerial photographs, and they had a wire strung over the sand tables. 
And they would hang these uh, photos up there and uh, we were very well schooled on our missions and the 82nd Airborne missions. And we dropped pretty close together. They dropped in St. Miraglis and we dropped all over the place, I think. But actually we were supposed to drop to, uh, my alpha was supposed to take the four exit bridges off the Normandy beach. And the, if you know what that is, when the beach landings hit, there's usually a, a wall and a few other things and they have a hard time getting off and they're getting killed. They're all the time they're there, they're being killed. So this time we uh, dropped in and we captured the, the roads leading off the beach that people used you know, to go down to the beach and back. And we had the exits one, two, three, and four uh, running from uh, Hubert on back going north. And that way we kept those roads open from the Germans so that they couldn't get troops down there but we could get our troops off the beach, otherwise more of them would have been killed. It's, uh, I don't know why they didn't drop paratroopers behind uh, Utah, um, o Omaha Beach, but it's probably because they didn't have enough of us. The 82nd and 101st had all they could handle in behind Utah Beach. Uh, we took off in the evening, uh, June 5th, 1944, and we flew a little while, and as we circled the, the over England, we had planes, and I was in one of the lead planes, and we had other planes taking off and joining us, and I like to explain it, it's like a comet. We were the head of the comet with a long tail, and as we circled England, more airplanes would take off and join the tail of the comet. We straightened out, went out around over the ocean, in behind the Continental Peninsula, over the Isles of uh, Jersey and Guernsey, and we received a lot of fire, a lot of fire. They said that we wouldn't receive it there, but we did. And then we stood up and hooked up as we uh, went over open water again towards the back side of Normandy. We did not come into the front. We came, we were, came over the continent, peninsula, crossed over that. So going out, we would have a short window to drop from where we were to drop to the actual edge of the water. Because if you waited 20 seconds too long, you landed in the English Channel, you went straight to the bottom, you would still be there today, like some of my comrades still are. At that time, I was very young. I weighed 140 pounds, had a 28 inch waist, I was 440 pounds, and I carried 150 pounds of equipment. That's counting the parachutes. I think the parachutes run about 35 pounds each, and then plus, you know, if you carried a machine gun, that's 42 pounds, and two cans of ammo and so on. Then I had a rifle, M1 rifle, had two bandoliers of ammo for that, plus a cartridge belt. I think all in all, I had maybe around five, six hundred rounds of ammunition on me, plus grenades, six uh, fragmentation grenades, uh, two smoke grenades, one orange, one red. Uh, orange meant friends are here, and the red, if you threw it out, the whole Navy blew you apart. So don't throw the wrong one out, unless you can run real fast. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there again, we did parachute in. My aircraft manifest shows that uh, on record that I dropped in at 1.14 in the morning. And the beach landings came in about six hours behind us. And by that time we had attacked the little town of Ravnoville under the command of Lieutenant Muir, who was from Bay City, Michigan. And uh, we took and liberated uh, Ravnoville. We got all the krauts out of it, in other words. And it was, it was, I believe, the first town in Europe to be liberated in World War II. Because we, we liberated it just before daylight. 